Welcome to the panel on private equity and social entrepreneurship. Uh, my name is Paul Tierney. I teach a course here in private equity and, and entrepreneurs in emerging markets, now primarily focused on Africa. Some of you have the misfortune to be in the class and have to hear some of this stuff a second time. Uh, but when Matt originally, uh, by the way, I'm also chairman of TechnoServe. There are a few people from TechnoServe here in the audience. There are a few other faculty members. I feel that uh, many of you in the audience know a lot more about this subject than I do. I'd like to have it be kind of a discussion in which we, uh, the, uh, the panelists, speak for about a half an hour and then we have an open uh, question and answer session for the last half hour. Is that okay with you, Matt? When Matt first asked me to chair this panel, I was a, I was a little reluctant to do it because uh, I didn't know, and I still don't know, what social enterprise means. So after extended conversation with Matt, both in person and on the phone, uh, he convinced me that he doesn't know either. <laughs> So this is an exploration for both Matt and me as to what this term means. And uh, I guess if there's one thing that uh, I'm going to say definitively is whatever social entrepreneurship is, it ain't easy. And anything involving private equity or investing in emerging markets, if it's worth doing, is very competitive. And I will cite for you a little anecdote with apologies for, to people who have heard this story before of a social enterprise fund which named itself that and, and was attempting to both make money and do good. And after a long time of looking for their first investment, found a deal that they wanted to invest in in Africa, in West Africa. And the transaction was basically that the investor was going to buy a piece of the company that was a manufacturing business and also contract with the company to build, construct a plant. So the Social Enterprise Fund worked on this, got to know the people at the business, thought they had a deal when the business decided that it would be silly not to have this be a competitive bid. So they went out, of course, first of all, to a Chinese construction company that was uh, in town and got a bid to build the plant for $3 million. A representative of the Chinese company explained that it was about a million dollars for parts, about a million dollars for labor, and a million dollars for the company's working capital and profits. They next interviewed the representative of the Social Enterprise Fund who said that uh, they certainly couldn't do it that cheaply, but they thought they could build the plant in uh, two years, the Chinese firm had said one year, uh, and that it would be $6 million. It would be $2 million for parts, $2 million for labor, and $2 million to cover all of the feasibility, environmental, and other studies that would need to be done in order to satisfy their shareholders. But they assured them that the plant, after it was constructed, would be socially responsible. Next, the last competitor that came in was a West African group represented by a very, very well-connected representative of their group, a person who was a native of that area. And he spoke with the representative of the intended investee company. And he said, we can do the job, but it'll be $9 million. The representative from the company said, $9 million, what, what's it for? He said, well, $3 million for you, $3 million for me, and $3 million to pay the Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not sure who won the competition, but one way or another, it was not the Social Enterprise Fund, and one way or another, it was the Chinese construction company, which is the point being that it ain't easy, and there's a lot of competition for good investments, much less good investments with the overlay of what I think social enterprise means. But rather than me go on about what it, what it means, I'm going to ask each of the panelists that I'm, uh, I'm pleased to share the dais with to express a little bit their own concept of social enterprise, to explain their own backgrounds and what they're currently doing, and then we'll go on to a couple of other questions and then ask you to participate as well. 
My two panelists that I'm, I'm pleased to be with have both accomplished things that uh, I very much admire. Paul Weissman, having been a, an entrepreneur himself, uh, currently the founder and chief executive officer of a company called Centennium Advisors, which helps firms in emerging markets to fund themselves in the developed markets. And having previously been an entrepreneur in Southeast Asia, particularly in Vietnam, and currently is still the owner of one or two enterprises of uh, which he can explain if he, wa if he wants to disclose it, uh, in Vietnam. And Cesare has a, uh, comes from the, uh, shall we say, the other side of the world of development, which is the uh, premier development organizations, having had a long and distinguished career at the World Bank and the IFC, and is currently a senior executive at Wolfenson and Company. The company, as you may know, uh, which was founded by the former head of the World Bank, Jim Wolfenson. Cesare also is a adjunct professor at SAIS in Washington and teaches a course related to this subject, but not exactly on it. So I will ask Cesare if you wouldn't mind to go first and make a few comments and then Paul. Sure, um, thank you Paul. Um, can you hear me? Okay. Um, you forgot to mention probably the most important qualification <coughs> I have for being here, the fact that um, the chairman of my firm, Jim Wolfenson, is the son-in-law of Mr. Botwin, who is being honored today. So, um, but leaving that aside, um, our firm, uh, uh, Wolfenson Capital Partners, is a private equity firm that specializes in uh, emerging markets. Uh, it has a focus on uh, um, sectors that uh, um, benefit from uh, certain social uh, uh, and economic trends, uh, particularly uh, the growth of the urban middle class, but also uh, that uh, operate in a manner that are uh, socially responsible. So our focus is heavily on uh, low carbon energy and also on uh, financial services, particularly uh, to the extent that they promote access to financial services. Uh, we are a for-profit organization, though, and we uh, like to maximize the return we provide to our investors. Um, on the definition of social enterprise, uh, I could come up with many, but the one that, that um, comes up to me immediately is uh, uh, an enterprise that has a stated um, a double or triple bottom line, that is a bottom line that uh, tends to maximize returns for uh, shareholders, but another bottom line that uh, intends to uh, create positive social externalities, benefits uh, to the environment or society at large. Uh, say microfinance to the extent that uh, it, it helps uh, uh, alleviate poverty by promoting access to financial services uh, falls in this category. Um, investment in uh, education and health uh, and uh, clean uh, energy also I, by my definition fall in this category. I think it's important to mention that um, there are lots of uh, uh, pure for-profit single bottom line uh, enterprises that also have these positive uh, social benefits and externalities. It's simply that they are not a stated objective for them and they don't measure themselves uh, against those objectives. Um, now, I have, I have some thoughts on how private equity has, uh, has helped the development of this sector, but I'd like to understand a little bit more how much time I should budget here and, and, and whether that should be taken up uh, in a later round. Or yeah, let's take it up. Let's give Paul a chance to give his okay. point of view and then take it up in the next Okay, round. very good. Okay, well, thank you. Uh, and thank you, Paul, for the kind introduction. Uh, I think I've been invited here today not so much because of what I'm currently involved with, which is raising capital for managers who invest in emerging markets, but more specifically because of my experiences in Vietnam in the 90s. But before I tell you about two ventures that uh, I was involved in launching, both very, very different, I just want to put this in a bit of context. 
It was about 31 years ago that I actually departed from this institution with a joint degree in public health and urban planning, having come through what was kind of a left-leaning program. I wanted to do something socially worthwhile, uh, live in Asia, and I left with the feeling that profit was kind of a dirty word. Uh, I spent, but I did come away knowing that if you want to make an impact on people's public health, the two most important critical ways to do that are to raise their nutritional status and give them uh, clean water. Anyway, after three years in the international civil service, uh, working with an international organization in Southeast Asia, I decided to leave because of uh, becoming somewhat cynical about the international civil service. And we can talk about that privately if you wish. And I decided to pursue uh, private enterprise. Fast forward 15 years. Together with an old college roommate, both of us coincidentally had lived in Asia at different points in our life in different countries. We decided to do something entrepreneurial in that part of the world, and we concluded that Vietnam was going to be the next great thing. You know, Thailand had already started to happen. China was for the overseas Chinese. So we spent two years going back and forth to Vietnam and uh, decided that the whole country had to be rebuilt and we would go into building materials. So before I tell you a little bit about that venture, Paul had asked the question, what does social enterprise you know, mean to us? And I'm pleased to know that I'm in good company in my ignorance. Frankly, I don't know what it means. I had never really thought much about social enterprise, but I have concluded now as a result of the experience I will tell you about that, in my opinion, if you engage in a commercial enterprise, but do so in a socially responsible manner, there are significant benefits to all of the stakeholders. And by that, by that I mean not just the investors, assuming it's successful, but certainly the employees and, and even the community around the enterprise. So what's an example of that? In 1994, uh, my old partner and I were lucky enough to raise initially about $22 million from several institutional inventors to launch a greenfield uh, ceramic tile manufacturing business and a granite processing business in Vietnam. And this was really the very early days. Our objective was uh, really to substitute for imported products that had been coming into the market. And in other words, create world-class building materials, in this case, ceramic tile produced locally with state-of-the-art equipment. Uh, it, it's a long saga and I'll spare you the details, but we did succeed in getting it up and running and in my opinion it had tremendous social benefits to many of the other stakeholders. Yeah, the, in fact, the investors didn't fare so well, but the, uh, sta the other stakeholders did. And by that I mean, for example, when we were building the plant, there were a bunch of little uh, kiosks that sprung up right across the street from the construction site. And they were, you know, selling noodles. The, there were a bunch of little girls cutting coconuts and proffering uh, coconut drinks. So first of all, just by virtue of starting to build in an area that had formerly been completely rural, you know, nothing going on except uh, some rice agriculture, a whole new local commercial economy began to develop around, you know, this plant. Once we got it up and, and ready to run, we ended up hiring a bunch of the people who had been hawking noodles and, and selling coconut drinks to work on the production line. So here we took people who had been living in a somewhat precarious manner with a very unpredictable uh, income and a very low income at, at that and gave them jobs in a factory that was state of the art, clean working environment, predictable monthly income, uh, health benefits, etc. Now, many of them I believe, are I know the company still exists, this goes back to 94, so it's already uh, you know, 16 years. I'm sure there's been some rotation, but the point is over several years, we created a thousand new jobs throughout the country uh, for people in many instances who had no skill prior to that and now had a predictable income. As you moved up the management structure, we actually transferred a lot of technology in various forms to people with a little more education. They learned about the raw materials that were required for ceramic production, they learned how to operate the machinery and became eminently employable uh, by other ceramic companies as competition came into the market. So in short, I think, you know, to me, that is a very good example of, I guess you would call it social entrepreneurship in a developing country. Now, the second enterprise, which I was not sure whether I should mention, it's uh, a little more recent in origins and, and perhaps a little more controversial in a form of this nature, but it is truly a social enterprise. Uh, 
uh, about five years ago, together with some of my original partners from the building materials days, uh, we decided to launch a nightclub in Ho Chi Minh City. The first <laughs> high class, high quality nightclub, which is still going today, I'm pleased to say, called Lush, Lush Saigon. And I mention this because some of you may consider it, quote, a social evil. But here again, first of all, there's an emerging middle class that is you know, desirous of high quality entertainment. We created an environment similar to something you'd find in New York and LA, created probably 75 to 100 new jobs for people who have very low skills. In other words, the waiters, the waitresses, you know, the bar backs, et cetera. And to me, we have actually made a contribution. We, we run it, it's a, it's a very uh, well-run establishment, a very clean establishment, and again, it's, it's created a whole economy around it. There were, as you know, there's a multiplier effect. We purchase food, beverages from you know, local vendors, et cetera. So depending on how uh, one wants to view social enterprise, in my opinion, that's an example of a, a very successful social enterprise. And for those of you that would consider that a social good, there'll be discount tickets for yeah. your next drink at lunch. <laughs> uh, w one of the things that I, th I see as an example that most people think of as successful social enterprises are some of the microfinance organizations in the world. Uh, Cesar, I think you have some comments to make on one which has been in the press a lot lately, which is SKS. Another one that we've studied in our class is the Equity Bank in Ghana, I mean, excuse me, in Kenya. Uh, Equity Bank started as a microfinance organization, is still funded primarily by small depositors in the rural sectors of Kenya, and has now become a public company, uh, which is the fourth largest capitalization on the Nairobi Stock Exchange. It's by far the largest capitalized bank in Kenya. Uh, something like six or seven out of every ten new deposits that get opened in the banking system in Kenya get opened at Equity Bank. Uh, but it, I don't want to make this turn this into a, a debate on, on microfinance, but this is an organization that is based on a real transactional uh, uh, tra a trade of value to both sides. People talk about microfinance primarily on the lending side, on the asset side, and fail to realize the importance of the liability side of the balance sheet of a bank. The funding costs to this bank, because of technology and because of granting people access to the banking system, is very low. And the transaction fees and the rates of interest charged on loans are quite high so that the rate of return on equity and the rate of return on assets is astronomical in relationship to developed countries' banking system in normal times. I'm not even talking about in comparisons to some of the recent <coughs> troubles. So is that a social enterprise or is that just a good business? Uh, it strikes me that on the other side of the ledger are businesses that are based on non-transactional uh, terms and I'll cite one of the big failures that I've been involved in. Uh, Technoserve, which is a, a, an advisory firm, we are providing advice to small entrepreneurs in the rural sectors of poor countries in Africa, India, Latin America. Have, we don't run a fund. We don't try to make social investments. We try to help entrepreneurs be better entrepreneurs and run viable businesses. But there's tremendous pressure within the organization, always temptation, to also manage a fund. So I said, if someone in the field can show me a, fund, a, a client that would benefit from our investing in it, we won't raise a fund, but we'll get the directors together and look at making an investment in that firm. So we were presented with an opportunity in, in Mozambique to finance a cashew processor who had all the characteristics of a successful entrepreneur and a very socially minded person who treated his employees well, helped to capacitate them. The sort of person was hard not to admire. We had him to New York, we got the directors together. He needed about a half a million dollars. We passed the hat, raised the commitments, made, an invest, made a commitment to him to invest in it. And he said, let me give it some thought. 
And he went back to Mozambique and then approached some not-for-profit organizations who gave him a grant. He didn't want any ownership in the company. They didn't want any control over corporate governance. They didn't want any terms and conditions and financed him on what is, 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 a, is a basis that's outside of the world of commerce. And of course, our efforts were all for naught. Who knows what happens to that entrepreneur the second time he needs financing he has to go from that source of financing to a market-based transaction. So that was, to me, a, a reinforcement of a good policy of us not be up being advisors, but not being direct investors. Cesare, I'll turn it over to you. Yeah, thank you, Paul. Um, you mentioned microfinance as an example of social enterprise, and, and that certainly would fit my, uh, my concept of uh, what is a social enterprise. Um, those of you who have attended um, Robert and Nibale's lecture this morning, which I unfortunately um, miss, um, will probably be familiar with the role that private uh, capital is playing in developing commercially sustainable microfinance. Uh, and this has been very much in the news lately because of the IPO of SKS in India, uh, which was funded uh, with private equity uh, from uh, Vinod Kozla, Sequoia, and, and other uh, investors. Um, we made 37 times the money reportedly in four years uh, uh, through the IPO. Um, this may sound um, stunning, but um, in fact it's not even unusual uh, by the standards of what we have seen uh, in uh, microfinance in the past. As uh, Paul mentioned, it can be very profitable. I was associated in 2001 when I was still at the IFC with, the, with an investment of $600,000 in Compartamos. Uh, which uh, returned more than 200 times the money when the company went public in 2007. Now, this has uh, created a lot of uh, soul searching in the microfinance community. Um, some people have been outraged at the profits made by the companies uh, and by their uh, um, packers. Um, they have been outraged at the rates that are charged, 30, 40 percent, sometimes higher. Uh, there has been a question as to whether the industry is losing its soul, uh, whether it's uh, fleecing the poor and so forth. Um, it, it's a complex debate uh, that I don't wish to enter uh, in um, too much, uh, except to observe that I read that SKS, uh, after six years of operations, now reaches six million uh, customers, um, most of which, in fact, probably all of, them, all of which are low-income people. Now, that's as many as Grameen, the most famous uh, microfinance uh, um, uh, entity in the world that operates out of Bangladesh, reaches after 30 years of operations as a donor-supported entity. Um, so there, there clearly is a lot of impact that you can achieve through commercially uh, sustainable, um, and financially sustainable, and quite profitable, in fact, microfinance. But I, I, um, I would like to, to make a comment, though, about uh, what's socially good. Uh, and I wouldn't want to leave you with the impression that uh, um, somehow private equity in emerging markets is good in, when it invests in uh, good and virtue, when it invests in microfinance, and not when it invests in leasing companies or banks, for example. Or that there is some, somehow a uh, an original sin to private equity to be redeemed by investing in virtuous sectors such as education, health, clean energy. Uh, these are good uh, initiatives. They, 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 they have social benefits. They have to be supported. Uh, but the story is much broader than that. And here I would like to mention um, that I've uh, seen that the private equity industry has an image problem. Uh, which has been acquired because of uh, uh, the, the extent to which it has been dependent on financial wizardry, uh, the piling of debt, leverage breaking up of companies, particularly uh, during period of market excesses. Um, however, um, that type of uh, image is really not very relevant to the experience of emerging markets. And here, uh, I'd like to spend just one minute um, um, talking about the results of a review of IFC's private equity portfolio. Um, 
you may know that IFC has been the oldest and by some standards the largest investors in private equity funds in emerging markets and therefore its experience is probably indicative of the experience of the industry at large. And the conclusions I found quite stunning. Um, in uh, uh, the past 10 years, IFC has IFC supported funds. This excludes direct financing by the IFC, which is the part of the World Bank that supports the private, uh, the private sector, have um, uh, invested in 706 companies, creating 300,000 jobs, the median annual job growth rate has been uh, uh, about 12% uh, as compared to 2-3% um, uh, regional norms. Uh, annual revenue growth in these investee companies, uh, the median has been 19.5% uh, uh, and the debt equity ratio has been uh, uh, a pretty reasonably low 0.33. Uh, the conclusions uh, of the study are that the drivers of profitability in uh, these private equity investors, the drivers of returns, have been uh, uh, growth and operational efficiencies uh, and not leverage and multiple expansion, which is what we often associate the private equity industry with. So there are very clear direct benefits of private equity investing in developing countries in terms of uh, jobs created, economic growth. But I would argue that the benefits go well beyond this, and I would like to mention very quickly three, and they are indirect. One is that uh, most emerging markets tend to have very ossified financial systems that are dominated by a few elites, and they are the ones that get priority in financing. The introduction of an independent, well-managed private equity industry uh, tends to break down these uh, um, systems to create opportunities uh, for uh, entrepreneurs that are not well connected and uh, to loosen the grip of the elites on uh, the uh, economy and the financial sector. Uh, the second is that in a context where there are weak institutions and weak market discipline, Private equity can provide an alternative source of governance and discipline to market discipline. And the third one is that uh, private equity investment is particularly well suited to sustaining innovation in a way that probably in an emerging market context, uh, the public markets, uh, public financial markets and the banking industry are not equipped to. So th those were my comments on, on the benefits of private equity well beyond social uh, enterprises. Paul, would you agree with that or take exception? Or? Uh, no, I definitely agree. As I said earlier, I think there are significant benefits to all of the participants. Well, not always to the investors. I will say in our original venture, the investors did the worst. It was actually the employees and, and the economy that grew up around our businesses uh, that really were the major beneficiaries. But I think not only the, the creation of employment, but Something that is often uh, not focused on is, is the amount of technology transfer that takes place. And I actually, I'd like to broaden the description of technology transfer. I don't just mean learning about new machines, uh, new techniques. In fact, again, using Vietnam as an example, when we first uh, got involved, there had been no commercial enterprises of any consequence for 15 or 20 years. And consequently, there was no commercial culture. People had no sense of marketing, customer service, desire for or to increase productivity, all of which are clearly uh, necessary if you are going to have a successful venture. And one of my favorite examples is, you know, when we first started our little enterprise, my partner and I would go out for a meeting, come back, and our secretary would say, well, you got a call. I said, well, from who? I said, well, I don't know. I said, well, you didn't take a message. You didn't ask, you know, the name, the telephone number. They were at such a primitive level, the Vietnamese, you know, in the early 90s in terms of their understanding of business that even something as simple as that was, you know, new and revolutionary. Uh, obviously, the country has come a very long way since then, and I like to feel that we actually participated, made a significant contribution in helping develop the uh, commercial culture that now exists in, in Vietnam and is so touted. Maybe on this point, it's a, it's a good time to ask you 
what questions you might have. I think that the three of us agree that successful private equity investing is requires much more than money. It's re the most important element of a successful business, especially in the emerging markets, is management and technology. And it's, in my opinion, uh, not sufficient for a social enterprise to be geared to be socially fair. Mm -hmm. It needs to provide knowledge. It needs to have insights. It needs to capacitate the business that it goes into. One of the most successful ventures I've seen recently, which is in Nigeria, is one in the towers business, which the IFC partially funded through Helios Capital, right? So Helios has built an infrastructure project in Nigeria. Anybody could have supplied the money, but their ability to organize the management and develop the business was what made it successful. They in turn became 20% or 25% partners of Equity Bank in Kenya. Why? Not because they were the cheapest bidder or the fairest bidder or the low cost bidder, but because they had both capital and access to all kinds of technology that was useful in the banking sector and have helped them grow into different uh, financial instruments and to access capital beyond just their depositor base. So most successful private equity firms are organized around knowledge bases and, and networks and management. And while the social enterprise business is uh, still a pretty new one, it rarely has the scale to be organized that way. Uh, okay, well, I'll take some questions. Is Matt, is that okay with you? Thank you for coming. My name is Christine Mendoza, and I had a question regarding when you're investing in companies in emerging markets, and you may have a mandate where you are adhering to certain environmental and social guidelines, um, but the infrastructure doesn't exist, whether it be for recycling, whether it be for renewable energy, in some of these countries. How do you um, adhere to that, like, that investment mandate? Like, How do you follow those guidelines in a country where they may not have recycling capacity in yeah. that area. Well, I think this is a question that differs depending on the perspective that you have, whether you're an institutional investor or an entrepreneur. Jesse, why don't you, I'm sure you've seen this a million times. I, I think it's an extremely interesting um, question because I was um, uh, plagued with that question um, when I was at the IFC, where we had introduced uh, state-of-the-art world-class environmental guidelines that had to be implemented in a context where there were none. You know, there were some very low standards dictated by law in many countries, but uh, um, nothing really that compared to what we were trying to achieve. So we found that consistently we would put our own clients at a disadvantage versus their competitors. Um, if you require them to, if you give them a loan of say $20 million and $10 million goes into um, environmental improvements um, to meet um, global standards, uh, best practice standards, when their competitors dump everything in the river, uh, then obviously only $10 um, million goes to improving their bottom line and they are placed at a comparative disadvantage. So, uh, one um, uh, solution was to try also to work at the policy level through the World Bank with the governments to try to upgrade the, the standards for the market at large. Try to lead a little bit, um, maybe help the entrepreneurs that, that, were, that we were assisting uh, get some uh, funding on soft money to, to help them uh, upgrade their environmental operations. But also um, have them accept that uh, eventually the, the industry would catch up. That is, that it pays to be a little bit ahead of the curve, even though in the short run there may be some cost involved. And, and yes, you may be uh, saddled with a little bit higher interest rate cost than your competitors who didn't have to borrow to upgrade their facilities. But eventually it pays off in terms of uh, um, reputational benefits and certainly once the, um, the, the government uh, standards improve, 
um, then you are, you are better off because you're already there when your competitors are, are, are playing catch up. Um, but it, it's certainly a very difficult matter uh, be, because we have seen that, in fact, the overall business culture, the overall uh, infrastructure is typically lagging behind uh, what we were trying to do. Does that answer your question? Okay. Hi, I'm uh, Dan Peck. I'm from the Yale School of Management. Uh, my question surrounds kind of how to mitigate... The Yale School of Management? Yale School of Management. How'd you sneak in here? <laughs> I do too. <laughs> we try. Um, I was wondering how you mitigate the kind of political business transaction or corruption risks in, from doing private equity kind of investing in Africa. Um, you've mentioned just simple risk of you tell one guy one thing, he goes to another guy, says what you know, you're going to do and you know, provides the service at a cheaper rate or just even doing uh, business in a place where you find you know, a nice piece of land, the, you buy it, the government says, well, I want that land now. So is there any way you can kind of mitigate that other than just knowing people in government or knowing the officials? No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a huge problem, but I don't know how that, there's a, 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 an answer for that question in general, right? Uh, it, it's, it, I feel that we approach m the question and get the most protection by knowing who we're doing business with who the people are that are running the company. And in the final analysis, we're entrepreneurial financiers. We're betting on other people. And if you're betting on people that are corrupt or betting on people that know how to work the system in ways that you don't find ethically uh, acceptable, then it's not going to work. Mm. But in every one of these investments, there are all kinds of twists and turns in which there are gray areas that have to be navigated. And I don't know how to give you a general answer to that, but it's certainly a problem in doing business in, in any emerging market, whether it's Russia, Africa, or elsewhere. Well, but there are also b industries that are worse than others, right? Mm -hmm. That if you know, if you go into a regulated business where there are several layers of approv approval, provincial and state and governmental, you know that there are going to be three times as many people with their hands out than if you were going into certain other types of businesses. I mean, you must run into a lot of uh, this in sure. when you're there at the bar. <laughs> well, not just at the bar. <laughs> but I guess the adjective I always uh, use when describing what doing business in a place like Vietnam, China, Russia is like is murky. Everything is always murky. Things are rarely black and white. It's very difficult to get a very straight, clear explanation of how things work. I think uh, what contributed significantly to our su success, so to speak, in the 90s, at least in terms of getting ventures up and running, was our ability to identify and recruit very intelligent, very thoughtful local employees who became literally our partners in, in, in every form, who also understood how to work with the bureaucracy, because particularly in places where there are few rules, where so much is left open to interpretation, much of what happens happens on the basis of you know, solidifying personal relationships. So I think it's critical to find very, very capable local people and uh, bring them into your organization if you want to work in countries like that. A, a term that's uh, debated a lot, especially in Africa, is conditionality, right? The Chinese are proud of the fact that they don't mess in internal politics and don't attach the conditionality that Western organizations, whether it's the CDC or the World Bank or the ID, IFC. Well, nobody invests money without conditions. It's just a different set of conditions. I think one of the things that Cesare was getting at is that the pure process of buying equity securities or debt securities, whether equity is preferred, common, convertible, they all have terms and conditions so that they move this murky area a little bit more in the direction of a set of rules that everybody can understand. They don't necessarily have any uh, valuative attachments to them. They don't tell 
people what color uniforms they have to wear in the morning if they're going into a mine. But they do set out terms of reporting, accounting, board control, all of these conditions modernize the way in which business is done and minimize to some extent the corruption that uh, mm -hmm. is a temptation. Hi, good morning. Uh, my name is Franklin Moore. I work for the Queens Economic Development Corporation. We help lots of startup businesses, small businesses in the borough of Queens. Uh, I guess a reoccurring thing that I'm hearing at all of the breakout sessions or even this morning is that no one defines social enterprise. Um, it's a two-part question. One, do you think that just good business is really social enterprise and just because of the, you know, the what the market wants, social enterprise will just happen and it'll just be what business will, all business will be eventually in the future. And then two, you know, one of the things that I see with a lot of startup businesses that a lot of people have good ideas and they're all kind of like socially conscious based businesses. There's a lack of capital obviously for those type of businesses. Will kind of the scheme of private equity change in order to better fund those types of businesses and those entrepreneurs? Um, whether that's by looking at social return on investment or partnering with uh, public and private partnerships in order to create those type of quote unquote social enterprises? Your thoughts on trends and kind of where we're headed, I guess. Look, I started life as a Peace Corps volunteer, and then I, uh, I started a business that I thought was a social enterprise, venture capital business. All my early experience tells me that your basic proposition that all businesses are socially good. Uh, that respect the rules mm -hmm. and play by the it is is my bias. Okay, mm -hmm. there's no one answer to this, uh, but I think that most businesses that try to be good and also be fair and make some money end up kind of in the middle, not doing too well at any of them. But I could be proven wrong. Do mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a big business or a continuing business? Sure. But I think some of it is a psychological phenomenon that people want to do good and they have a hard time going into a desk at Goldman Sachs and trading <laughs> futures and think that they're doing good. Even though they might be able to take an intellectual uh, analysis of what they're doing and saying, you know, it's business. Does a baseball player provide something that's socially responsible? When he gets up to bat, is he trying to be fair to the pitcher? Or is he trying to get a hit? You know, business is a contact sport. So I think some of these people that you might be talking about that have good ideas that are socially worth promoting in Queens, maybe the source of capital ought not to be a business source. Maybe it ought to be government or, uh, or, or something else. Yeah, I just don't believe that private equity will move further and further in the direction of social enterprises. I think in the end, it is about returns. I think if you could demonstrate that you could get an equivalent return and yet you know, conduct a business in a socially responsible way, that's fine. But I think just a social enterprise in and of itself will not be a sufficient uh, motivation to shift the whole private equity world uh, in that direction. I think if Aristotle was here, he'd ask you, what's, what's not a social enterprise? Is it an anti-social enterprise or a social non-enterprise? <laughs> Hi, Pavna through NYU Stern School of Business. I'd love to hear from you how you're pitching investments in Africa to your investors. Are you actually pitching them as financially, investing sure. in financially attractive businesses that just happen to be in Africa, or are you actually pitching them as providing capital to businesses that are serving local communities and aiding development of, of these countries? And also, what kind of appetite are you seeing among investors for investing in socially responsible businesses in Africa? Yeah, um, I, I did a fair amount of work in, in Africa uh, in the 90s when I was with the IFC. And uh, 
the, uh, it used to be considered the least desirable region to work uh, for a variety of reasons, including the fact that it had been very difficult uh, to generate good returns. But then when we looked at why that has been the case, we saw that um, the reason was that our portfolio in Africa was heavily concentrated in those sectors uh, where IFC had done badly worldwide. It just so happened that those sectors were particularly heavily represented in uh, the type of, op of private sector opportunities that we saw in Africa because of their weight in the African economy. So we had a lot in uh, agriculture, a lot in um, um, tourism, which is a very difficult seasonal business, and a lot in uh, uh, some uh, type of manufacturing like textiles that was very heavily uh, impacted by um, competition from Asia particularly. Once you adjusted for this uh, sector of composition, the returns in Africa were actually um, somewhat better than the returns in other regions. And in fact, once uh, uh, because of uh, uh, privatization, uh, um, economic reform, uh, new sectors started opening up. I'm thinking particularly of infrastructure and financial services, and of course, with privatization also very much oil, gas, and mining. Then the picture changed. In the financial services area, for example, Africa was the most profitable region for IFC, followed by uh, Central and Eastern Europe, simply because the margins were extremely high. Uh, in oil and gas and mining, that was also the case. Um, telecom was a spectacularly successful and profitable area. So once you, you adjusted for this sector of composition, Africa actually did well. Uh, and I've seen some numbers from uh, the US uh, Commerce Department showing that uh, in terms of return on foreign investment, Africa has been consistently uh, the highest return uh, uh, continent. Uh, now use these numbers with a grain of salt because uh, they are very heavily influenced by the um, extractive industry uh, sector that accounts for a very large portion of uh, foreign investment in Africa. But um, it gives, you know, it's not all bad news. It's simply that uh, you read the papers and you, you uh, read about the wars, you open the TV, you hear about the bad news, but from an investor point of view, there is a lot of very good stuff there. And uh, in answer to your question, we, we only justify our own investments on the first category, but they're bounded by certain things that we wouldn't do. So there are categories of investments that we would not be in, but we're representing to ourselves as investors or our co-investors that we've got a good risk-adjusted rate of return. Now, do we hear about people interested in making, I guess what you mean, uh, you know, kind of, Social investments, I hear a lot about it, but it's a, I see a lot more smoke than fire. In TechnoServe, where we're advising businesses, I imagine some of them with very common elements to the ones you see in Queens, where we're trying to help people build businesses and be successful grassroots entrepreneurs, they need capital. And it is devilishly tough to find people to finance them. Hi, my question is on uh, specifically venture capital in emerging markets, and I'd like to focus on it because it seems to be an asset class that um, even when it's only paying attention to a single bottom line creates disproportionate positive externalities. So two-part question, um, how important do you think it is that uh, private institutional investors pick up the slack in emerging markets in early stage and late stage venture capital? And then secondly, given the experience we've had in the US in that asset class in the last decade, how do you explain that uh, LP experience will be, or investor experience will be different in emerging markets? Do you want to ask one of us that? Hmm. Uh, whoever feels most comfortable. Yeah. How are you feeling? Comfortable? Well, <laughs> I'm feeling real, I'm getting hungry, but... Uh, <laughs> no, I'll just try and address the first question which is uh, the importance of uh, private in, uh, capital in emerging markets, of private venture capital. I think it's extremely important because many of the ventures uh, that 
are seeking capital in these markets are very small in nature. I think they're far below uh, what would come on uh, IFC's radar screen or the radar screen of you know, most uh, multilateral aid agencies. So I think there is definitely a role, particularly for individual investors or venture capital groups uh, that are willing to invest in you know, li literally very small enterprise. I don't mean microfinance, but things in, in the one to $5 billion category where there's a, actually tremendous opportunity and yet a real scarcity of resources. Yeah, actually, if I may add, um, because I got some numbers, uh, uh, I was referring to, uh, the, to the IFC experience uh, in uh, uh, supporting private equity funds in emerging markets. And uh, in the past 10 years uh, of the um, companies supported, 64% uh, had fewer than uh, 250 employees. Um, so they are uh, relatively small. Uh, again, these are companies that IFC has reached through funds, n not through direct investments. Uh, the, the other uh, data that I think is interesting is that uh, although uh, return numbers uh, are very heavily dependent on, on vintage year, uh, if you look at um, the past, uh, the returns um, from 2000, to uh, year-end 2009, uh, the IFC private equity uh, funds for emerging markets, which I think are a very representative sample of the emerging market private equity investing industry, return 18.1%. Um, that, um, that was better than uh, uh, the numbers uh, uh, that you get uh, from uh, um, the, U the Cambridge Associates U.S. private equity top quartile, which was 14.1 percent. And uh, uh, it was also better than uh, the returns on the MSCI, the benchmark um, for emerging markets, uh, which was 13.4 percent. So there was clearly a, an additional value from the point of view of the investors uh, to this type of uh, asset class. You know, we're used to in developed markets of thinking in boxes of venture capital being one thing, private equity being another, real estate investing being another, these different alternative asset classes. I would say that in emerging markets, these lines are very blurred and that an awful lot of what is being done in private equity under the label of private equity is venture capital because there's a huge need for capital in developing the infrastructure of many of these countries. Mm -hmm. So you don't need a port facility to be built by private equity in New Jersey, but you do in Mozambique. And you don't need a towers uh, business to facilitate cell communication in uh, France, but you do in Nigeria. So starting these businesses and funding them are what would be called venture capital here, but they're big. And then there are more traditional, what we think of as venture capital, in knowledge-based societies, mm. places where there's high technology capabilities, India, for example, or China, in pharmaceuticals in particular, and, and in Russia in certain uh, forms of math and you know, science-based mm. activities. Yeah, Matt? Let me one last question. Did you? Uh, to kind of build on the theme that uh, has, has transpired in, in approximately the last 10 minutes, and to Professor Tierney's comment that uh, venture capital and even, even uh, certain types of private equity is devilish, devilishly difficult to come by, do you see any trends of that changing? Um, I'm with a company called Litchfield Holdings. We're clean tech investors, late stage. Um, and given the current marketplace, we've found it virtually impossible to find any reasonable round B financing to, to grow those ventures. In fact, we've had to go outside the United States because you know, Washington has really produced no fruitful policy to start growing, let alone clean tech businesses, small business in general. Well, I can't speak to your business or to clean tech, but I can say that in emerging markets, I envision a, a flood of capital to take the opportunities that are there. It's a result of higher growth rates. You know, if the United States will be lucky to grow at 1% to 2% for the next few years, China will continue to grow at 9 to 10%. All of Sub-Saharan Africa ought to grow at 5%. Uh, 
or maybe those numbers are wrong, but the relative rates of growth are so much greater. And private equity deals are being bid here in the United States where the sponsors think they're gonna get you know, low to mid-teens. And Cesare gave all these interesting statistics on, in the past, these high teens rates of return in what are perceived to be the most uh, risky areas of the world, uh, I think they're gonna get better. Yeah, uh, just to add, uh, there, is, uh, there is a very precise correlation between uh, the ease of raising funds and therefore the vintage year of funds and the returns. In the years when a lot of equity is raised for emerging markets funds and in general for private equity funds, um, the returns are bad. You, you will see that that vintage uh, when it's very easy to, to raise mm. uh, funds uh, uh, will produce uh, substandard returns because there is a lot of competition. Conversely, you could expect that those funds that have been raised in the past two years, not many, will do very well because there will not be that mass competition. Uh, there is a lot also of, of regional differences. We find that in India, there's just a, an, an enormous supply of capital now bidding up deals. Um, very often they don't even give you an opportunity to do due diligence. If you don't snap the transaction, somebody else will. And that will probably not produce very good results. There are other markets where it's much more difficult to get financing from an entrepreneurial point of view. Okay, Matt, that's it, huh? Thank you. Thank you.